Morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to use technology in my presentation, so it's bound to go wrong, but hold on, we'll, we'll see where we go. Right. Um, I'm the program manager for the whole system demonstrators, and uh, so four years of my life have been sort of taken up with this program. Um, and it's been very rewarding, but also very challenging. And so what I wanted to really take you through, because I know there's a, a range of faces that I do know, but also lots of people I don't, sort of the journey so far, you know, where we've been, what's happened over those four years, you know, what the successes are as well, because there's lots of peripheral elements to this program that I think have really sort of helped progress this sector, and just want to talk a little bit about that. Um, I then want to show a video from one of the sites, which is the Newham site, where there's a, a video going on, um, a visit going on later today. We also have Cornwall and Kent here doing presentations in a workshop that I'm sharing later. Um, but that really shows the different perspectives, clinical and sort of patient and sort of um, care user. Uh, and then finally, just a bit of a reflection on where we've seen potential barriers. So, uh, so I'll sort of talk about that. In terms of the history, um, the concept of a, a program that would look at robustly analysing telehealth and telecare came about in 2006 in a white paper called Our Health, Our Care, Our Say. Um, and then it took us from that sort of half-page description through the year and into 2007 to define what we needed in terms of a trial and to seek the funding. Because as I say, this is a, not an insubstantial amount of uh, funding for a, for a trial. But what we really wanted to do was make sure that we could do this sort of robustly and answer a lot of those questions for once and close down the need to do a lot of smaller independent trials uh, and avoid that duplication. We opened a competition then for sites that were willing uh, to be part of the program and we got a lot of interest. We got about 29 sites um, and we selected the sites in 2007 and then went into a detailed planning phase where we sort of built the evaluation team as well as um, sort of building the site teams, agreeing the scope because obviously ambition is huge uh, in, in a lot of these areas and we really had to focus it down. Uh, and we obviously had to go through procurement and sort of all the other go governance issues that are involved in running large scale changes uh, within the health and care services. So we began recruitment of trialists in 2008 and obviously in parallel sort of um, gathering data. And in, um, so, so that began in May 2008. In September 2009, we finished recruitment. So over that sort of 15 month period, we recruited all of the people to the trial. Um, 2010 has been spent gathering data and as you can imagine there's a lag on some data such as hospital data sets so if the last person on the trial finished in um, September, October then there's three months before we can see some of their clean data and obviously now in 2011 we're deep into the evaluation so that's a sort of a, a timeline of where we're at. Along the way I think there's been many successes. I mean I think one of the first things that was a great success was that this level of ambition was signed off sort of a department level and um, it was sort of recognized within sort of the health and care sectors that these technologies hold massive promise and you know we want to be at the forefront of them we want to be understanding where they can be a benefit how they can fit into our care services and how we can really improve quality um, and and at the same time productivity obviously um, we funded we secured the funding and we also um, secured a program team to support this over its rollout um, and we've got significant interest interest from around the world you know this is a, a program that's sort of very high profile because lots of different nations are asking the same questions so we're hoping that the reach is much greater than just the UK um, to facilitate the program uh, and the wider spread of these technologies we work with PASA initially and then with buying solutions to, to launch a national framework agreement for the procurement of these technologies which again is something that hopefully eases the implementation of them and a, a key success for me was also the launch of the Action Network which has been associated with the program and hosted from the King's Fund and Chris I think I'm writing saying uh, Nick, Nick Goodwin is here and Mike Clark who are key to delivering that and Susan um, that it's the site with the most hits on the King's Fund website, which I'm very proud of. So that's, <laughs> that's a, you know, and that is really a platform for sharing the evidence in this sector. So we've got telecare, telehealth, telemedicine. You can search by condition, you can search by technology type. But also Mike plays a great role in giving everyone the latest news about what's happening worldwide in this sector. Because we need to be looking across the globe to see what the developments are so that we can be one step ahead of the game. 
I'm also very proud to be an associated with something else that was launched in parallel with WSD, was, which is the uh, Technology Strategy Board Assisted Living Innovation Platform. There you go, I got it right that time. But again, that's a, a large sort of um, research program with around £50 million worth of funding. And I don't know if uh, Graham and Mike are in the audience, but we've worked very, very closely with WSD to identify some of the problems and issues that um, sort of have been coming up through delivery and then channeling them, channeling them into calls for research through the, through the TSB. Um, one thing I, you know, I'm proud of as well is the evaluation is very complex, and Stan and the, uh, the Chris and the team who put that together got through ethics on first call, which is, you know, amazing given the complexity of the program. And also, we built a good central team, so everyone who's been involved in the program at the DH has gone on to do uh, do well in other things, often increase their project management skills, and also have got colleagues in the audience from KPMG who are in, you know, instrumental in sort of helping us do the good project and program management on this. I think um, we've got some spin-offs as well, in a way. We've done other studies that aren't part of the core evaluation. So we've looked at existing users, people who've been on uh, sort of telecare, for example, for a number of years, and to see what are the characteristics of those individuals. You'll see later on that a number of systematic reviews will be presented, again, that sort of try to summarise the latest evidence. And we've got an ongoing study in Newham that's looking at sort of mobile monitoring of diabetes in younger people. So there's been other elements that aren't core to the programme, but still are going to have an important influence, I think. Um, the, there's people in here from Cornwall, Kent and Newham and they've been through the pain with me and, uh, but what we've been success successful in is building new services in each of those areas and what many people have said to me is that's driven integration so we've all talked about health and social care integration integration with the third sector, integration with private partners, what this programme has been is a vehicle to explore that at scale really and to drive it at pace as well because we had some sort of fairly tight deadlines we have been successful in delivering the uh, number of people on the trial that we said we would, um, and Stan will go into more detail about that. Um, but we've also done work with some of the sites and uh, our informatics colleagues in the department to look at sort of um, integration into of telehealth data into existing GP systems. Um, and through the sort of DH involvement from early on in organisations such as Continua, we're very keen to support moves that will make this technology interoperable. So again, we have inter interoperable technology that will drive price down. So uh, we think that's very important. Um, Stan will talk in detail about the data that's been delivered. Um, it, it's a really super robust set. Um, that we think will sort of set the benchmark in terms of this type of study and so you know whilst it's been a huge amount of effort I'm very proud of everyone that's been involved in the program in terms of uh, making that happen and also on the sites and they'll be talking later about how they've mainstreamed some of these efforts so they've seen what they want to do with these technologies it's not exactly what we did on the trial because the trials are quite constrained over the period of it because of the nature of an RCT what the sites are doing now is slightly different but it's built on their experiences and as Stephen said, the early results are very promising. Uh, it's a complex story. You know, this technology, these technologies are fantastic for some people and not for others. And what we're doing now is digging down to understand that. Um, but um, when we come onto the video, I think what I have seen and going out and speaking to patients and um, sort of people on care who use these technologies in their families, when, it, when you get it right, you know, there is no doubt that this transforms people's lives. And that's, you know, a very rewarding thing to be involved in. Um, this is how it's felt, basically. You're successfully knocking down barriers, it says at the bottom of that, uh, that cartoon. But every week, for the four years we've been going, we've had new risks and issues to manage. And through sort of collaboration and cooperation and a bit of pragmatism, we've managed to get through them. But it hasn't been simple, and it won't be simple when anyone else implements this. And it's about sort of uh, being tenacious and seeing the end goal and keeping going at it. So that's one thing I think uh, I certainly am, and it's uh, the team has been as well. So, uh, you know, I think we can say any service transformation is difficult. When you add in the, uh, an element of technology, then it seems to get sort of uh, people's resistance up a little more than normal. And so... We've sort of really had to uh, sort of use all of our stakeholder management powers possible to get this thing off the ground. Um, I put this slide up really just to say that whilst it's been hugely complex and, you know, we're talking about new risks and issues every week, there's been a very small percentage of them that have been to do with the technology. 
most of this is about changing people's behaviors. It's about sort of cultural issues. It's about partnerships. It's about relationships. And it's about some overall infrastructure things and financing things. They're the usual things that sort of slow down services. And it's been no exception with this program. So um, I think the legacy of the program, as far as I'm concerned, is we've built lasting capability through the sites involved in the Action Network through the three sites in WSD, through all of the partners that have worked on this program, I think we've raised the game in terms of awareness of these technologies in the UK. So there have been hundreds of people involved in delivering WSD, and all of those have spread out across the, uh, the, the UK and farther. So I think you know, the impact isn't just the trial. The impact is the knowledge that we've built up across delivering a program at scale and how that spread is going to help these technologies sort of evolve over the next few years. So this is where I'm hoping everything works. But what I'm going to show you is a, a video from Newham that really just highlights some of the experiences of the people on the trial. It's typical of the experiences in the three sites. As, as we've said, the story's complex. Not everyone gets on with these things, but a, a, a significant number do. And I just wanted to reflect that. And um, then after that, I'll hand over to Stan. But here we go. The UK is faced with an ageing population. People are living longer, and more and more are living with long-term health conditions or disabilities. This presents a greater burden on local health and social care provision, where resources are already under pressure. As the population is getting older, it means that we are having pressure on the funding system. So I think we'll need to look at how we're going to fund social care in future and other ways of making sure that everybody gets the right sort of care. There's an explosion there about to happen and the prediction is that public expenditure is about to double in the next 15 years, even if we do nothing. To help the system cope with this growing problem, there's a lot of work being carried out nationally to find alternative ways of providing good care choices. One of these is the WSD, or Whole Systems Demonstrator Trial. We just want to see how you are really, because your SPO2 has been a bit low. WSD is a national trial using telehealth and telecare technologies to help people stay at home. You can take a hold from that. Commissioned by the Department of Health, the trial makes use of assistive technologies to help people manage their own health whilst maintaining their independence at home. Telehealth is aimed at people with long-term health conditions. So what sort of equipment do you need to enable people to stay at home if they're unwell? Telecare is monitoring and support provided to patients who have social care needs such as falls detectors, fire alarms, and summoning for extra support and help in the home. Your alarm telephone is dialing for assistance. The trial aims to look at the benefits of using these technology insofar as keeping people out of care homes and also out of hospital. And the vast majority of people, if you ask them, would choose to stay at home. Newham Council and NHS were successful in their bid to become one of the three sites to take part in the WSD trial. Telecare, telehealth are very important to us here in Newham. We've got a lot of challenges, we've got a lot of people from a diverse population. Newham have certain demographic factors. We have a lot of people over the age of 65. We have a lot of people who are unwell with long-term health conditions. We see the usual factors and socioeconomic spread, so it's made a real testing ground, an effective test bed for the application of the whole systems demonstrator in different types of household setting. Part of the trial will be to look at ways of exploring for GPs, for nurses and for hospital staff of how it can benefit them. Your weight's up a bit today, how are you feeling? For GPs in Newham, the whole systems demonstrator is important in two ways. Firstly, it's actually affecting and changing the way we can look after our patients with these long-term conditions, and that has a whole series of impacts. 
Secondly, it's important in as much as it's informing the future and what we're likely to see happening in a whole series of ways with our front end of looking after patients. I am the WSD Nurse Manager and I'm also the Lead Nurse for District Nursing in Newham. I can actually see that the assistive technology of telehealth will support my services in the future purely because we are asked to do many tests such as blood pressure monitoring, blood glucose testing and we could actually encourage in the future the patients to do those and then they would come into a central point and then if there's issues with those readings or we need to signpost it, we can signpost it back to the GP or we can signpost it back to the district nurse to follow up. We work very closely with the community matrons so we can monitor their patients for them and say, you know, they come in as I say, we started somebody on some antibiotics or some new diuretics and we're able to monitor the patients and highlight a concern for them. In some cases it has picked up some serious problem that was happening but actually the client actually didn't realise that that needed to be addressed but the MR team actually said, look, according to your readings you really need to call your matron and I've put things in place very very quickly otherwise we would have had a big problem if we have waited. It's important, if you need it you can use two posts. Thank you very much. We also do quite a bit of health promotion, helping people lose weight, controlling their diabetes through diet and supporting them in giving up smoking as well. My name is Henry Charles Willis. I made a triple vascular bypass and then I got this COPD, which I didn't know anything about. COPD is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which is the lungs, because I smoked many, many moons ago. And that's about it, you know. So I can't walk anywhere these days, and my breathing's a bit too tight when I'm talking. It doesn't affect me till I start walking, actually, when I'm outside. And I do, like, 50 yards, and I have to stop and have a breath and uh, carry on from there. Telehealth has given me confidence in myself because I know my own body now and I can adjust me what I do according to how I feel with the telehealth. And uh, anything goes wrong, they don't touch straight away. Yeah, we're just going to see how you are today. It makes me comfortable to, to know that they're there. And they're like guardian angels, that's what I call them, they're the guardian angels. I keep myself fit, I feed myself pretty well, I like my cup of tea, I like The technology is not intended to replace human contact, but is designed to support patients, carers and independent living. Right. Turn the iron off. Okay. Don't want to set off the smoke alarm. <laughs> Telecare enables people to live in their home independently and for longer. And for us social workers, it's a huge amount of difference because without telecare support, we'll have increased amount of um, admission into hospitals, admission into A and E. And most importantly, we will have a lot of people going into residential and nursing home. If vulnerable people get admitted into hospital, they occupy a high needs bed and it's very, very expensive. And once they are ill, their immunity goes low. So of course, they, they pick up infection very quickly. If they can be supported to stay at home, I think that would be, that's a great thing. My name is Ruby Ford Alexander. I'm 74 years of age. One Sunday night, I was in the bathroom and I was having a wash and I stretched out my left hand to hold something and I couldn't hold it with my hands. My fingers could not bend. I rang 999 and they asked me what was wrong with me and I told them I think I had a stroke. Since I had a stroke, I have a memory problem. I used to leave the light and the water running. I didn't want to do that, but it just happens. And that used to get me upset. So Telecare has installed a heat detector, a smoke alarm, and a flood detector in the bathroom. So that helped me very much. Even the tablets, when I forget it, it beep. I couldn't understand why it was beeping. And then they rang me from telecare to tell me to take my tablets. The 
introduction of telecare into Mayan's life almost guarantees her her independence. Since I've had telecare, I'm much happier about things and about my own life. So we have all these sensors to be able to support them immediately and fast. So it's basically you've tripped over and you're on the floor and you can't get up. Do you think you need an ambulance or do you want your name? The aim of the technology is to ensure that it is cost effective. So there's no point substituting one expensive healthcare system with another. So part of the trial will be to evaluate the cost benefits of using these technologies. So what other benefits can be anticipated from these assistive technologies? When you look at what happens over time, over six months, 12 months and longer, you can quite clearly see, for one thing, the disease metrics and the frequency of exacerbations. We see them reducing. We also see that having an impact on the patient's use of services, where we can see a reduced number of attendances in A&E, reduced number of hospital bed days, emergency admissions, exacerbations and complications. We see individual patients, when they do get worse, recover more quickly and follow instructions regarding changes of treatment much more compliantly when they do have their exacerbations. If someone is basically exacerbating their disease condition is not stable, we will start emergency treatment at home. But with access to telehealth, I'm able to actually check if they're responding better to the treatment remotely. So from that point of view, I think it allows us to work more efficiently, but also it gives me another sort of tool in terms of to risk manage my patient. Self-care is actually our philosophy. I mean, we aim to get the client to understand their conditions. In patients' homes, they have a television screen and we can put down educational videos, surveys, as well as monitoring their health. By doing that, the patients have actually been taking a much more active participation in monitoring their long-term conditions. What we're doing is we're putting it on a screen where they actually see what happens to them on a day-by-day -day basis, and that's quite powerful. And a lot of patients have said and fed back to my nurses but that's helped them actually change their lifestyle. The initial results are quite strongly in favour of keeping people out of hospital, but whether that's due to planned or unplanned care, we need to evaluate that and actually look at that more scientifically. The feedback I've had from users is very positive on the whole. Just the fact that they know that help is just at hand, just on the press of a button, is very comforting, very reassuring to them. It's letting us live here in comfort, yeah. and we're going to stay here for as long as we possibly can, with a little help from our friends. Are you in any pain? When we're working in times where we are having to have less nurses on the ground due to financial constraints, telehealth seems a real way forward to support such services and all I want to see is it rolled out in a much wider context because it's got huge potential. The technologies that are being investigated and assessed as part of the WSD, they're almost inevitable. They have to be rolled out and they will be rolled out. The key question is going to be who gets to decide and inform how those technologies are used. Right, um, and thank, thank you everybody. I think that sort of summarises the... Uh, <laughs> obviously, I'd like to thank Sheena and sort of uh, Martin and Richard for the video from, from Newham, and it's on their website, WSD website there. But um, the, the stand will obviously give a more balanced view of Martin's claims about the benefit for everybody. Obviously, this is showing the positive side, but uh, I, I think it sort of summarises what we've done on the programme and where we've got to. And so... Um, very briefly, I think there's a number of lessons we've learned from the program. We need to raise awareness about these things. Hopefully we'll get evidence from WSD. Um, we need to understand about the, you know, the market and what we can do about that, quality standards, interoperability, and sort of organizational readiness, because it does take a lot of effort to put these things in place. 
but that's sort of all to come. We know that eventually these technologies will be commonplace. It's just how quickly we get there, really, that's the issue. Um, and so the next steps are going to be covered by STEM. So thank you very much. Thank you.